right. And I think it is 6 o'clock. Welcome to Sunday Evening Worship. So glad to see all of you all here, all of your beautiful smiling faces. And I think most everyone was on time. Martin, you just got to come by yourself, man. If you wait for her, you'll be late every time. You can't blame Martin for that. But uh, let's go to the war, uh, Lord in prayer as we begin our Sunday evening worship. Father, today has just been a great day. God, we just thank you for the many, many blessings, God. We thank you for the food that we ate today. We thank you for the fellowship that we've had today. We thank you for the, the coming together that we've been able to do today, despite everything that's going on in this world. God, we just thank you for giving us this, this anchor point that is your local body, where we know that no matter how far out we go, no matter how much, how much of the deep end we wade, that there's always a spot we can come back. And that is to you. And so God, just continue to bless us, continue to keep us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, so I get to sing again tonight, and we're singing 502, Tis So Sweet, To Trust in Jesus, and we're going to sing all four verses singing and making a joyful noise to the Lord and helping drown me out. So announcements, we will pick back up on Awanas next Sunday evening. Um, there's no Dicey Given Circle meeting on uh, this Tuesday. Uh, the following Tuesday, we will have deacons meeting the 18th, and the business meeting will be on the 19th, the monthly business meeting. Are there any other announcements? I'm forgetting. All right. Sweet. So, I don't know if I, I told you all, but when you, when you think of uh, Joseph and Rebecca Bennett, the missionaries to Honduras, they actually just got back to Honduras yesterday. They were supposed to be gone before Christmas. Uh, there were some health issues. They didn't tell us what it was, but uh, I saw on Rebecca's timeline that uh, after only a couple hours of sleep, she was on a flight back to Honduras. So they are back in Honduras, 
and back where God has called them to be. But continue to pray for them. Um, we'll be taking a team, or Felicia and I will be part of a team that was going up there at the end of this month for that week. Um, I'll be teaching the students again at the academy or at the Bible Institute. I'll get it right eventually. And uh, I, they teach me more than I teach them, I'll tell you that. And uh, so we're looking forward to that. So please keep Felicia and I in your prayers. And then Felicia's going to be a little bit crazy this year. About three weeks later, she's going to go with Tabitha Moore. You remember the Moors that came here, and they're running the um, school from here. Uh, Tabitha's taking a team, her and Udo, and they got some work to do. The bridge out there that keeps uh, um, getting flooded over and destroyed every time something drives over it, they're going to go out there and actually fix that. Felicia's going to work with uh, Tabitha in the school and do some things uh, inside the school. So she'll be gone another week in February, later on in February, as she'll be taking another trip to Honduras uh, to, to help Tabitha and Udo out with uh, that mission trip. So uh, just continue to pray for Honduras. The cool thing is, as of today, we don't have to take a test going out if we're vaccinated, but we've got to take a test coming back home. And I'm hoping what happened to my aunt don't happen to Felicia and I, and we get, <laughs> we get a positive test, and then we're stuck out down there in Honduras. But... Uh, I wouldn't say it's stuck. I, well, we wouldn't be able to go nowhere. They're already locked down enough as it is. So just pray for that and pray for the, the teams. We're just one of many teams that go to Honduras every year, go to Nicaragua, go wherever uh, missionaries are. So just uh, pray for your missionaries. Um, we've kind of gotten away since we got rid of the missionary moments. I, didn't say get I, don't, I shouldn't say get rid of them. They're on the bulletin board out there. But I would like to get more personal with the missionaries, not just – talk about somebody that may or may not have gotten money that we've given to the cooperative program. Um, I'd like to actually talk about and pray for not only those missionaries, but missionaries that we know and that send us reports and updates of what's going on, boots on the ground. So, uh, But continue to pray for the Moors, continue to pray for the um, Bennetts uh, and all the missionaries across the world. So this evening, if you will turn your Bibles to Philippians chapter 3, uh, Philippians chapter 3, we're going to be in verses 12 through 15. And there's going to be a lot more verses I'm going to read as we go through with this. But, you know, it's the new year, right? We're already nine days, got nine days of the new year essentially behind us. And I don't know about you, I'm not a big fan of New Year's resolutions because I'll make one on the 31st of December. And on 1 January by about noon, I've already broken it. So I, I'm not a big resolution fan. Maybe some of you are. Maybe some of you, I know some folks call them goals. Uh, some folks label a word to them, like this year we're going to be more intentional, and that would be intentional in relationships, intentional within our relationship with Jesus Christ, intentional with our relationship. You know, so there's all sorts of different things that people can do um, as far as making and setting goals. Well, and here in Philippians, what we're going to see is where Paul talks about a goal. Paul talks about a goal, and it's not only just a goal for him, he just defines it, but it should also be a goal for all believers. And so Philippians 3, 12 through 15, what you're going to see is in much of Philippians because the, the, uh, the island uh, or Philippi was near Greece. And we know that Greece had athletic games. Uh, matter of fact, that's where the, Olympi the Olympics came from. So Paul uses this imagery because he knows that the Philippians will understand what he's talking about because of their um, proximity to the country of Greece. But Paul uses running. Paul talks about running a lot. And so what he's using here, the analogy of running, he's using this here to talk about Christian growth, spiritual growth. He uses the analogy of running, right? And it is not a sprint. It's not a sprint, as you'll see. It's a marathon. It's a marathon. Now, some of you are in the military, you may know this, but you get a new commander and a new officer in every two years, right? For the enlisted folks, we may be there four years, five years. Heck, some people were at a base for 18 years. I don't know how. But I met one one time, and I'm like, you've been here 18 years, went to Korea one time, and that was it. And then he ended up retiring from that base. So anyway, um, you know, when a commander comes in, it's a sprint because they have to make their mark. The only way they're going to get promoted is if they change something or take something that we already do, rewrap it into their ideologies, and then stick it back out there, you know, put the lipstick on the pig, and it's good, and everybody's still doing great, and they get promoted. Well, so for us, we know it's a marathon because that individual is going to come and go, we have to do whatever we need to do to be able to sustain uh, our capabilities, our operations. But what, so I'm, I tell you all that to say, when, you, when we are a Christian, Paul tells us that our life, our spirituality, it is not a sprint. We don't go from kneeling 
at, at the altar and accepting Jesus or at your house or, you know, at a diner or, you know, wherever you accepted Jesus Christ at, we don't go from that to being spiritually mature. We don't go from that to automatically um, expressing any of the fruit of the Spirit, right, of the nine expressions. So being a Christian is a marathon. It is a long race, but it, and, it, and he likens it to a race because at the end there is a reward. It's called glorification. It's called glorification. So we're going to pick it up here um, in uh, verse 12 in Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3, verse 12. Paul wrote, not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way. And if anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. So we, we see right off the bat that Paul admits, I am not perfect. I am not perfect. Matter of fact, what Paul is telling us, if you look at just these three verses, and he tells us this multiple times throughout his his uh, books that he has written in the Bible in the New Testament church. But what he tells us is, you know, he, he knew he wasn't perfect. And he knew that only perfection came from God. Perfection only came from God. See, Paul's ultimate goal was knowing Christ's resurrection power and dwelling with him in the age to come. Paul wanted to be just like Christ. We call it Christ likeness. Every day as a Christ follower, we should want to be more like Christ than the day before, right? Uh, I mean, that's how I was uh, uh, raised in church. That's what I was told, and I think it's a good rule to live by. We don't always make it, right? Some days we're worse off than we were the day before, but that's a goal that we should have. But let's dig a little bit deeper into what Paul is talking about, and we see what Paul is talking about, and you, this is in chapter 3 also, but verses 10 through 11. When Paul's talking about knowing Christ's resurrection power and dwelling with him in the age to come, this is what Paul is talking about. He says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in death, in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. So Paul, if, if Jesus Christ took it upon himself to die on the cross so that we didn't have to suffer the consequences of our sins. Paul, was, Paul wanted to suffer on this earth. Paul was good with suffering on this earth. That was how Paul made it his own. That's how Paul, that's what Paul's talking about when, he, when he's saying that, you know, now that, not that I've already obtained this or I'm already perfect, but I press on to make it my own. What is Paul trying to make his own? Christ's likeness. He wanted to be more like Christ. Paul wanted to take what Christ did and insert it into what he did each and every day. Paul wanted suffering. Paul wanted suffering. Matter of fact, that's why he wrote Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Because in his suffering, he knew that he could be content because of who? Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross and who Jesus Christ was to Paul, Paul's relationship with God. Then in verse 14, when he talks about, I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. The goal, the goal, if you, if you read these verses, the goal for Paul was Christ-likeness here on this earth. Paul believed that himself and all the believers needed to be Christ-like while here on this earth. Now, what are we talking about? Again, we're talking about the expressions of the fruit of the Spirit. Peace, gentleness, humility. I don't know them all by, by heart. Tommy, you probably do. But I always get a couple of mixed up, so I'm not going to sit here and try and say them. But that's what being more Christ-like is about. That's the goal, is to live out a life that is pleasing to God. And you can only do that if you're trying to be more Christ-like. You, you, you can't live a life that's more pleasing to God if you're in the world, if money is your God, if possessions are your God, if your spouse is your God. You, you can't 
It just doesn't work. It's like putting a round peg in a square hole. It's not going to work. So our goal here on this earth, what Paul is telling us is that we need to be more Christ-like here on this earth. Everything that we, sh- we do should be about how would Jesus do it? What would Jesus think? Right? What's the chief end of man? Glorify God. Whether we eat, whether we drink, we're supposed to glorify God. Now, that doesn't mean, right, because I've been in those churches. Do not laugh. Do not have fun. Do not make comments. That's not what, it's, that's not what the Bible is talking about. Being a Christ follower, should be, we should be the most funniest people, the most fun-having people to ever live. Because Jesus was the, per, was, the most, was the funniest man to ever live. I'll spit it out in a minute. If we believe God was perfect, or Jesus was perfect, we believe Jesus was the, the greatest human being to ever live, he had to have a sense of humor. And you can actually see it in some of uh, the New Testament writings in the Synoptic Gospels. You definitely can see some sense of humor from the disciples. In some of their interactions. But our goal, Paul says our goal here should be more, to be more Christ-like. And then our upward call is glorification. The upward call is strict, is simply glorification. If you're a Christ follower and you are saved, if you walk out those doors and have a massive heart attack on the steps, or step out in the street and, and somebody runs you over, you are instantly in heaven, right? So what he's talking about is the upward call in verse 14 is the glorification. For the prize of the upward call. See, that's our prize. That's our prize. So our goal, our gold medal at the end of this marathon that we run called life is going to be glorification. And if we think about that, that should drive us to want to be more Christ-like while we're on this earth. Because if he's going to give us a perfect body, if he's going to make us perfect, why wouldn't we want to be like that down here a little bit? Or try. Of course, we can't be perfect down here. Right? Why wouldn't we? Why wouldn't we? Now, I'm glad you all asked, but I know your next question is going to be, what way is Paul calling the mature believers to think? So what way, in verse 15, is Paul calling us to think? Here's what I love about Paul. You can go backwards to understand what he wrote later on. So we're going to jump back just a little bit, and we're going to see what Paul is talking about when he talks about um, let those of us who are mature, in verse 15, think this way, and if anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. So here's what Paul is talking about when he talks about Mature believers and what we should think. Now, understand, you can take this word, think, that is used and was translated from the Greek word. You could take that and put attitude as well. You could put attitude as well. But here's what Paul says in chapter 3, starting in verse 7. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, in order that I may gain, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes from faith in Christ. The righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I've already obtained it, and that's where he goes into the, but that's what Paul is talking about. What way are we supposed to think? God is everything. We are nothing. Now, that that does not mean that we put ourselves down, right? Because what that means is he who lives in us makes us worth something. But anything outside of what God wants in our life, anything outside of God, what God wants for this church, for this body of Christ, is rubbish. And oh, by the way, it's okay. Because if it's going to keep us away from being Christ-like, if it's going to keep us away from obtaining that goal, let it be gone. That's what Paul is saying. He counts it all as lost. I don't want it. 
I don't care how much joy it brings me. I don't care how much money I make off of it. I don't care, I don't care, I don't care. That's what Paul is saying. Count it all as lost. I want whatever makes God happy. I want whatever glorifies God. Not me. This is Paul. But that's what Paul is talking about. We have to be willing as Christ followers to obtain this goal of Christ likeness to be able to lose things for the cause of Christ. We have to be able to lose things for the cause of Christ. Now, I say this kind of jokingly, but, you know, if, if I felt convicted tomorrow that I couldn't watch another down of NFL football, my beloved Cincinnati Bengals, that would be tough for me. That would be tough for me. But what Paul is telling me is if I have to lose it to gain something in Christ, to be more Christ-like, then I should be happy about it. I should be happy about it. And then I want us to turn our attention just very briefly you notice who Paul leaves the non-believers or the people, or if, if you think otherwise, you notice he leaves them to? He doesn't leave them to the other believers. He doesn't leave them to, let's say, he doesn't leave them to himself. He doesn't say, if you think otherwise, come talk to me. Write me a letter over here while I'm in jail. What Paul says in verse 15 about that is, that, and if any of you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. So he leaves it to God. He leaves it to God. What's Paul saying? We save nobody. We can share the gospel. We can be more Christ-like. But we, we can't regenerate anyone. That only comes from God. But see, here's what Paul is talking about. Because there, there is some discipline in here, especially if you're a believer and you start thinking otherwise. Like, I have some pretty good friends who I know are saved and are very sound in their theology. But the churches they work at, the messages they preach, they got to keep the numbers. They got to keep the money coming in. It's no longer about God. It's now about the dollar being the largest of something somewhere. It's about them being on TV, them being on the Internet. You know, it's always a show thing. But here is what Paul is talking about. And if you look over in Hebrews chapter 5, uh, 5 through 11, and again, you can write it down. You don't need to go there. And this is what Paul is saying. And if you have forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons, my son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have the, to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom the father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline, in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them. Shall we not so much more be subject to the father of, the, of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them. But the discipline, but he disciplines us for our good, that we may share his holiness. For the moment, all disciples seemed painful, or all disciplines seemed painful rather than pleasant. But later, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. So that's what Paul is talking about. God will punish. And oh, by the way. Again, as I, as I talked about this morning, not to keep going back to it, but if I'm walking in the dark and I stub my toe, my first thought should not be what's God pay me back for that he didn't already know about or already get me for. That's not the discipline we're talking about. There's convictions. There's convictions. If you are able to commit a sin, knowingly commit a sin and not feel convicted, you might want to find out, A, are you truly saved? Or B, have you backslidden? Have you moved far away from God? See, when, when it, it's up to God to do the disciplining. It's up to God to write those people, to write those ships, to direct those ships. It's not up to us. We can be an example. We can love them. We can tell them lovingly that we don't agree with the way they live or what they're doing. But after that, God takes care of them. 
just like he takes care of us. And if they can continue to live that life, if they can continue to live that life even after all of that, it says right there, Paul, uh, the, the writer of Hebrews tells us they're illegitimate sons. They were never sons to begin with. So it's up to God. It's not, it's not up to us. It's not up to the church. Many a times we get so wrapped around the axles about, you know, why is so-and-so doing this? Why is so-and-so doing that? Why? We can talk to them. I'll talk to them. I'll love on them. I'll tell them where they, they may or may not be uh, doing the right thing. But I better come from the Bible with it. That's the other thing. I better not look to them and say, well, we've never done that. You know, preacher Jim back in the 1970s said, this is how you're supposed to live. That's not what we're talking about here. That's why I'm providing a lot of scripture, because this comes straight from the word of God. So the bottom line is our attitude is a direct reflection of Christ in our life. If Christ is abundant and first and foremost in our life, and we try to live Christ like each and every day, despite our failures, and continue to fall back on him, then we will start expressing fruit of the Spirit. We'll start growing it. People will start seeing it. God will be able to use us. But if we don't, then we'll just walk around like illegitimate sons. We'll act like it. We'll be a horrible testimony. We will take people and take them down the wrong path. But our attitude is a direct reflection of Christ in our lives. See, Paul knew that to work toward and obtain the goal required an attitude that was Christ-focused, Christ-centered. See, I could have walked up here tonight and just said, center everything you do on Christ. That's essentially what we're supposed to do. That's what Paul is talking about. Center everything on Christ. We have to be Christ-focused. Right now is tough. I was talking to Donna this morning, and, you know, we're going into what, our third year, two and a, second and a half year of, of COVID. How many things in this church have we said, hey, we're going to do this? We've talked about it in committees, or we've talked about it in here, and then something happens, and we can't get to it. That's frustrating. I know it's frustrating for you. It is very frustrating for me. It's very frustrating for me. But we have to remember, here's where, where I'm going with this it, it, this morning and tonight, God is in control. And no matter what happens, as long as we stay focused on Christ, we're going to be okay. We're going to be okay. It's not about the numbers. It's not about how many visitors walk through that back door. We can't control that. That's God. What we can control is what we look to, what we focus on, what our goals are. And so if we can focus on those things, that's what, as a church, as a body, individually and together, collectively, that's what our focus should be. In 2022 and beyond, we should be focused on Christ. Everything else will take care of itself. Everything else will take care of itself. So there's a prayer that I really like in Psalm 51, or it's a, a psalm, but a, it's a prayer that I think each and every day we could start the day with. I, I love it. Now, I don't like why. It was written by uh, David. It was after Nathan came to him, after he had the affair with Bathsheba. But this is the prayer. This is just a couple of verses. The whole thing is a lament and prayer about, um, you know, God forgiving him for what he did. But Psalm 51, 10 through 11 says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Again, this prayer, I think, can be, can be, or this, these verses can be turned into an individual prayer. And they can also be turned into a collective prayer for the larger body. Not just the local, for the larger body. And so that's what our goal this year should be. Is to have, a, create, have God create a clean heart. Make sure our hearts are always clean. Make sure we're always pure. Re, renew our spirit. Make sure our spirit is right. Make sure that we're doing what we need to do to take care of our spiritual relationship, our relationship with our Heavenly Father. And this was tough because it happens. I don't know about you, but I want the Holy Spirit here. 
I want the Holy Spirit in anything and everything that not only this church does, but as a collective Christian uh, body, I want the Spirit to be there. And I definitely don't want to be the one that's got the unclean heart that maybe causes the Spirit to say, not, nah, I'm not in that. I don't want to be the cause of that. And I would hope nobody that calls themselves a Christian would want to be. But I just like this Psalm 51, and I'm going to take it, and I'm going to, I'm going to pray it. I'm going to, I'm going to figure out whether I just pray those couple verses or add those couple verses in my prayer, but it will keep me focused on what I'm supposed to be doing. I'm supposed to be glorifying God. I'm supposed to be obeying God. I'm supposed to be more Christ-like today than I was yesterday. And I cannot do that without God. Let's pray. Father, it is our utmost hope that our hearts are clean, our hearts are pure. God, and that our thoughts and our actions and our words are pure. It's hard for us to sit back and understand and, and allow you to work sometimes and we want to jump in there and all we do is just mess things up. I know I am very guilty of this, especially in times like now where I feel like we're just spinning our wheels in the mud because every time we try to do something, something comes up. This COVID we've been dealing with for two and a half years, three years, God, you know all about it. So God, just help us in 2022 and beyond that we just have a clear focus on Christ. Help us to focus on you, nothing else. And I will pray this for me, that if there's anything that I'm doing, if there's anything that I have that is keeping me from that right relationship, being more like you, take it. It is yours. So God, be with each and every person here tonight. Continue to bless those that are sick. God, those that are dealing with illness, those that are dealing with loss of loved ones. God, continue to comfort, continue to be the peace. Give them that peace that surpasses all understanding. God, be with each and every person as they leave here tonight. Help them arrive to their home safely. Give them a great week. And we just thank you and praise you in your most precious and holy name. Amen. All right. Prayer requests. Messiah, we, we know we got the ones this morning. Um, there's no update. I talked to Nicole a little bit via text message today, checking on her. Uh, she thinks she may have the flu. Her and Kay were around the same student that they think gave, passed it on to Kay. So um, she's at home right now. I don't know if she's got results back yet or what, but she's at home, not feeling so hot. Anybody else got anything going on this week? Anything needs needs prayer? All right. Huh? Yes. Tuesday is his surgery. Um, yeah. We'll try to keep everybody updated, whether we do a robocall um, or text messages, but we'll keep everybody updated on Mr. Bruce. How are Freddie and Carol? Anybody see them anymore? Okay. So they're going on with that surgery. I mean, is that what they're trying to look for, look at doing? Okay. All right. Yeah, I think last time I'd heard from Katina was like a week ago, two weeks ago. So thank you. And Carol and Freddie. Don't forget uh, Danny Godwin. Um, I failed to mention him this morning. We've been praying for him, but he's got cancer. He's battling cancer, and now he's got COVID. So pray for him. Uh, they were working. Last time I talked to Rhonda, uh, which was, I think, yesterday or the day before, but uh, they were working to get him the, the uh, transfusion. Is that what they call it? Infusion. Yeah. They were working to get him the infusion, um, but they hadn't gotten it to him yet. But here's the thing I didn't understand is wife can't get it. 
And I'm thinking if you got a cancer patient in the house that is susceptible to this disease, or I'm sorry, this virus, you would think both would be able to get it. But so I don't know what was going on there. But he was going to, they were working to get it for him. And she was, I guess, just going to have to be isolated away from him. So, which is hard when you're the caretaker, right? But so we continue to pray for uh, Danny Godwin. Mastectomy. Okay. You said Jessica Bricks? I don't remember this last name. All right. Sorry, I had things going through my head. I don't know how Nicole does the worship, because I don't know if you saw me this morning. One, I'm very uncomfortable with it. You all know that. But I start thinking about things, and I lose where I'm at singing. So it's a good thing that they're not, wait, you all ain't waiting for me to come across booming like Nicole does, or because multiple times throughout them songs, I would be like singing, and I start thinking about something, and then I'm like, oh, wait, where are we at? And so I don't know how Nicole does that, um, or how anyone does it that is talented that way. All right, any praises? Always give a chance for praises. That's awesome. Dylan <laughs> Dylan sent a text to Felicia and said, when are you going to let me out of this prison? And she said, well, when are you allowed out? So she sent me a text. First had symptoms Saturday previous, so 10 days is tomorrow. So Tuesday morning, he can come out of his room. So I just don't think he knows what's coming because Felicia's going to make him strip everything in that room, spray it all down with Lysol, wash everything. So, but uh, he gets to come out of uh, purgatory on Tuesday. So that's a praise. And so far, nobody else has gotten it, had any symptoms. Can't say we didn't have it. It could be asymptomatic, but nobody's had symptoms. All right. Thomas, you mind praying for us?